Hi, everyone. Today, I've been given the honor of introducing Dr. Uh, Bruno Camden. Professor Camden is a co-founder of a minority-owned consulting startup called ne Lepton Actuarial and Consulting, where he serves as the principal and ESG and sustainable finance practice leader. He's also an adjunct fac faculty in the Department of Finance and Risk Engineering at NYU Tandon, and he will be taking the course called Sustainable Investments next semester. So if you are a student in the department, you should definitely consider taking the course. He is also a part-time lecturer in the Mathematical Finance Department at John Hopkins University. Uh, Professor Bruno has published articles in respected journals, such as Journal of Fixed Income Energy Policy, Renewable and Sustainable Energy Reviews, etc. And he has presented all across the world at conferences and seminars. Today, he will be speaking on the topic, uh, Machine Learning Framework for South African ESG Factors. And it is my absolute honor to introduce him. The stage is all yours. delight to be able to, to be introduced to you and uh, to see uh, quite a few uh, in the audience interested in this uh, uh, topic. Very exciting topic. We're going to uh, talk uh, quite a bit about BRICS. Uh, everybody knows about BRICS, Brazil, uh, Russia, uh, India, uh, uh, South Africa, and China. China is the key one. So we're going to be looking at uh, the system analytics, uh, sustainability analytics, the index, and using machine learning to, uh, to analyze those, uh, yeah. everybody uh, can hear. Okay. Hello? Everybody here? Okay, good. So we're going to uh, start. I think this is working, right? Is it working? Yeah. Can you uh, move this uh, Please plug it to the other side. So um, uh, this, uh, okay, great. So we're going to start by uh, looking at ESG, the definition. Uh, sometimes people know what it is ESG, or some don't know, but most people don't know what uh, ESG encompasses. We, we talk about some motivation and look at some li recent literature uh, related to what we're going to be discussing and then get into uh, our discussion on ESG indexes development, but we're going to focus on the GSE, which is the Johannesburg Stock uh, Exchange. And then uh, we look at efficient set and then the prediction and modeling and finally uh, make some, some conclusion. So what is ESG? Uh, ESG basically, uh, many people always ask that question in America. Maybe many don't know what it is, but uh, in Europe, in China, many know what it is, right? It's a set of criteria used by investors and companies and firms to evaluate um, and access the sustainability and ethical impact of uh, uh, 
an investment. That's what uh, uh, ESG is. Uh, even of uh, your day-to-day -day activity, are you uh, promoting uh, those, uh, those value related to, uh, to the E, environmental, to the S, uh, social, and to uh, the G, which is uh, uh, government, right? So that's what ESG is. Now, let's look at um, uh, the ESG invest investing side. What is ESG inve investing? And by the way, as uh, Priya said, uh, I've, been, I've been teaching for the past two, three years a class here called ESG investment. Um, it's, uh, it look at all these issues related to ESG, the, the analytics, and we focus mostly on, on the quantitative side of it. It's not very uh, narrative. It's engineer and a little bit mathematical based with uh, coding involved. So ESG investing is, uh, uh, it encompasses uh, responsible investing, sustainable investing. It's an approach to investment that consider not only financial returns, but also the ethical, social, and environmental impact of an investment, right? So if we, uh, let me go back a little bit to uh, the previous slide, if you can. I wanted to, okay. Uh, okay, if you look at the E, right, the E uh, the domain, right, let's, let's look at that and focus a bit on that. And then we can understand the investment aspect of it, right? The E domain has to do with the way a company environmental impact uh, works, right? The evaluation of the company environment, environmental impact and how it manages its environmental risks. That's what it is on the E pillar. And when you look at the S pillar, it mostly emphasizes the, the way the company manages its relationship with employee, customers, supplier and the community in which the company operate, right? And then the G refer to a company management and oversight structures, right? Uh, what are the policies and practices regarding, for instance, uh, transparency, governance, uh, transparency, right? or board composition, uh, uh, the relationship with union. Uh, many of you guys have heard about uh, recently uh, Ford, and uh, General Motors, they, they, they have a union, they won. That's the G part, right? That's the, the government part of uh, the ESG. It's gradually getting popular. It's becoming mainstream in America, despite the push. Uh, but it's becoming mainstream. Now, we're going to look at some of the reasons why. Um, but it's difficult because of the push uh, from others. But in places like Europe, uh, China, uh, South Africa, it's, it's becoming mainstream. So when it comes to ESG investment, ESG investment is what is uh, an approach to investment that consider, as we just said, not only financial return, but also the ethical, the social, and environmental impact of an investment. When it comes, if you look at the E, for instance, right? ESG investor here want to access a company environmental practices and impact, right? Evaluate how a company manage the carbon footprint, effort to mitigate climate change, uh, measure that, right? When it comes to the S pillar, the, uh, the investor consider how a company interact with its employee, customer, supplier, society, right? Um, is the company some of the practices negatively affected, uh, affecting the society or the community in which they live? And then the S, the G, uh, here, the investor, ensure or require that company are managed in a responsible way and ethically. And they measure it, right? It's, it's important. They measure it and find a way to, ad to maximize their returns, uh, maybe by being, becoming part of an ESG fund or while doing good. So basically, uh, ESG investing is making money while doing good, right? You want to make do good to society while you make some money. So uh, here, next, we're going to talk about the motivation of uh, research. What is the motivation behind our, our research? First of all, uh, we look at uh, the notion of uh, uh, trading. Um, each trade firm on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange experience an ESG 
convergence. What do we mean by ESG converge convergence? ESG convergence, convergence is uh, the alignment of environmental, social, uh, and governance practices and standards across different industry, company, and, at, and region. Um, ESG uh, convergence involves the process of harmonizing and standardizing ESG criteria a reporting framework to create a more consistent and uh, universally accepted set of white lines, right? Sometimes they call it taxonomy. Uh, very soon, the, uh, the Security and Exchange Commission, I think sometime early next year, uh, they're gonna be emitting regulation regarding ESG, for instance, ESG disclosure. So, investor who um, incorporate ESG uh, consideration into the investment decision making seek company with a positive performance in all three sustainable domain that's why we talk about measuring the measure are they doing on the E domain or on the S domain and the G domain and then they convince investor mostly institutional investor to come and invest with them and uh, make business with them right uh, Company with responsible and sustainable practices are more likely, right, more likely to produce higher risk-adjusted return in the long run. Several studies have found out. We we'll talk about some uh, in, a, in, a, in a few minutes. And you guys, for instance, look at uh, maybe the wealthiest person, uh, some of the wealthy people around here uh, in the world. The children, even if they don't care about ESG, the children care about ESG. ESG. So if they want to invest their money, they're going to go to somebody who wants to take their value into consideration. So we're talking about trillions of dollars that those, uh, those who inherited money uh, are going to be uh, investing. So they're looking for um, a company firm that value ESG consideration. So that's why this really, uh, this really matter. Uh, now, uh, when uh, ESG returns and sustainable to in portfolio uh, allocation, this is another uh, set of motivation that uh, need to be um, taken into consideration. Here, if you look at uh, the paper by Jen, Jen and Jen, look like the members of the family, the same family, they um, show that uh, individual investor make investment decision under the influence of some combination of behavioral biases. And this bias mainly included uh, disposition effect, mental accounting, investor overconfidence, representativeness, and, and many others. And then you have another uh, paper by Giglio et al. back in 2021, first, on the notion of uh, portfolio allocation. They show that belief are reflected in portfolio allocation, right? If you believe in EHT, uh, if you believe in diversity, if you believe in the environment, the climate change, right, you're gonna, that can affect the way you uh, allocate your portfolio. That's gonna affect the way you invest your money, right? If you go, for instance, in France, uh, climate change protection of the environment is part of the constitution of France. So that's why most investors there really want EHT fund. They want to invest in EHT related fund. So, now, uh, that the same paper talks about individual heterogeneity, that belief are mostly characterized by large and persistent individual heterogeneity. Demographic characteristic explain only a small part of why some individual are optimistic and some are pessimistic, right? Particularly regarding the future of the climate or the future of the Earth. And then uh, they make some inference about expected return and rare event. Expected return and the subjective probability of rare disaster are negatively related, both between and across investors, right? So these uh, are a part of uh, some of the, the, the motivation of uh, this paper. Now let's look at the, uh, the literature contribution. Here we, we have, um, a few uh, uh, a paper, uh, if you go back to 2004 and 1999 and 2000, you see that behavioral, this paper, should that be behavioral biases portfolio are formed as layer pyramid where each layer is aligned in uh, 
to a specific investment objective. And then you, you move a little bit upward, if you move upward, right, to 2010, 2013, ESG criteria contributed to overall portfolio diversification. All right, this paper found out that uh, ESG consideration really matter. And if you go to, uh, let's move to 2012, 2011, uh, a little bit, uh, company with high ESG score tend to have less company specific risk, right? You can do the study in European company, in Canadian company, even some US company, you'll find out uh, in, in that paper. Now in 2013, Neji, uh, Nagi, Kogan, and Sinrich examine the efficient characteristic of free ESG title portfolio strategy to demonstrate superiority to non-ESG buyers portfolio, right? So another paper back in uh, 2017 report how both small and large investor incorporate ESG screening information in first valuation model and uh, second input into portfolio optimization model. And then let's go back to Giglio, uh, more recent, two years ago. They, they show that the layer pyramid of objective approach for new support, right? Objective approach. And then what contribution really related to uh, the South African uh, uh, Johannesburg Stock Exchange, uh, as we're going to be, be discussing, looking at uh, the NKD group uh, indices, the ESG indices from the, from the, uh, from the NKD group. So now, uh, the reason why we have this uh, this, uh, we have this slide here is because of later we're going to look at MSCI. MSCI is a very big player in the ESG uh, uh, world, right? They have some of the best uh, uh, the, the metrics. They, they, they're very involved in measuring uh, ESG uh, consideration across company, uh, not only in the United States, even in Europe and in, in South Africa, as we will uh, discuss later. Uh, so that was one of the, the reasons we have uh, uh, we have this uh, slide here. So now let's um, continue and look at how we derive our G, uh, Johannesburg Stock Exchange ESG index. Right. So it's uh, it's a very methodical um, process. So the first uh, step is to we obtain the data, right? We obtain the data. We obtain daily adjusted closing price for all equity trading on the uh, Johannesburg Stock Exchange, right? We, we get that data. See here, data is very important. If we did not have access to this data, um, we would not be able to uh, undertake this, this study, uh, even though we master maybe the technique, the, the technicality behind it. So we obtain, uh, after obtaining the daily adjusted closing price, we then obtain the adjusted closing price for the uh, FTSE. Uh, the FTSE is the Financial Times Stock Exchange, right? Which just say, uh, is, uh, is a series of stock market indices that are mostly uh, present uh, in, uh, in, the world, in the whole world. So we um, divide that by the GSE and, and use it as, a, as the market proxy. And then the next step is to clean the data. We, we clean the data uh, out. All equity with error over 50% of zero or missing, that means 50% uh, of zero or missing information are removed from the analysis. So originally we had 293 uh, security, right? So, but we were able to keep 204 security. And the data period uh, here, we run them from uh, June 2020 to uh, uh, June 2023. So if you count the number of trading day, actually, it's gonna be uh, 910. And then the next step was to uh, lock returns, right? Compute the lock return of ec for equity. Uh, we have the, the return, K is the uh, security. Right, Actually, yeah, K is the security, and T is the observation, right? So we, we look at the security for the position next day. As you know, we uh, do the subtraction to get uh, the, the return. And then we similarly compute the market return. And then uh, we do the residual matrix analysis, right? We, 
by doing the obtaining the residual uh, matrix, which is var uh, epsilon kt for the 204 ORS uh, regression, right? So, and we do that by looking at the return for uh, for each uh, uh, security uh, each time, looking at the alpha and uh, and the beta. Uh, uh, Times, uh, times to market. So that's how we derive the residual uh, component of the matrix. So uh, next, we look at the NKG ESG uh, information we, by obtaining the daily use-based ESG indices from the NKG group, right, which is the, uh, the WFSI E, the WFSI uh, S and NG, right, under the Oh. Okay, it's too high. Oh, okay. Can you do the test, please? You wanna? Yeah, can you hear? Hello? Hello? Yeah? Okay, it's a little better? Okay, good. Okay, great. So, yeah, thank you. So we're talking about the derivation of the um, GSC uh, ESG index. Um, so we were here obtaining the, u, the daily use-based EHG indices uh, for, uh, uh, from the NKG group, right? Uh, right here, okay, let me see, uh, yeah. So we were there. And then we performed the, um, the Barclay uh, test, right? The Barclay test is uh, very city, right? It's very city, right? It's very key city. It's just a test that uh, um, ensure that the uh, the factor analysis here is valid. We're going to talk about that uh, later. So for that test, we assume we we take in, uh, the we, we we say that we infer that. Um, the new hypothesis is there's no common factor, or just pretty common, and then uh, we, uh, we have a, a, an alternative hypothesis. Uh, uh, and then we test for residual matrix, right? It takes residual matrix for some part adequacy using the uh, KMO uh, test. So the next step in the, the creation of these indices is to use the GSE residual matrix and one of the residual vectors from the NKD index to execute an exploratory, exploratory factor analysis. After we've done that, uh, after we've done that, we move to conduct two more uh, exploratory factor analysis, each time changing to a new residual vector of the NKD uh, EHG. So after we've done that, we can go ahead and implement the kaiser gutman um, selection criterion. Uh, the reference is in the paper uh, uh, for lambda uh, greater or equal to, uh, uh, to one, right? So here for lambda greater or equal to one for factor uh, retention. Uh, that's, uh, that's important. And after that, we rotate factor using the very max uh, orthogonal, uh, the very max orthogonal um, 
uh, is uh, very max orthogonal rotation. What's the very max orthogonal rotation? The very max orthogonal rotation is just um, a, uh, a statistical technique, right, used in factor analysis to simplify the interpretation of the underlying uh, factors. And here, the lambda are the eigenvalue, right? They usually um, are used for dimensionality reduction, right? So, such as the, the PCA. Many of you guys probably are familiar with the PCA, the principal component uh, uh, analysis, which is very well done in R and Python, yes? Uh, the NKG Group is a company based in uh, Providence, and uh, uh, my co-authors, both of my co-authors are owners. They, 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 they own that company. They, they work at um, the professors at the University of Fort Allen, the business school, and they own that, they own that company. It, it, yeah, it comes through them. It comes through the group, right? So they have a, they, they have a, a place a way they, co they collect. They, they, they're very present in South Africa. The indices uh, is pretty much recognized by the Johannesburg um, uh, stock exchanges. Uh, so yeah. So um, so we, we talked too about yeah we already explained what the, the very mass um, rotation here is is is, uh, is about. So so after that we uh, um, evidently. Uh, Rotate the factors, right? Now we have 26 factors are retained for uh, the WFSI uh, uh, for the environmental domain and for the social uh, domain. And uh, 27 factors are retained for the uh, for the E for the G domain, right? Right. 20 27 factors for analysis are retained for 27 are retained for the uh, for the G domain, and then we compute the factor score using the thomson rotters maximum uh, volatility. Right? Uh, for each uh, exploratory factor analysis loading matrix, we identify the total number of factors, which is C, where the uh, NKD variable had a loading greater or equal than uh, than uh, 0.0, and then. For C, uh, C for the E domain using the WFSI uh, uh, is uh, 11. For the S domain is 5, and for the uh, for the G domain is uh, is 11. We we we'll talk a bit more about that in a few minutes, and then we take the average and divide by the factor score to obtain the Johannesburg uh, 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 index for the E. For the S and for the G, uh, for the G domain, right? When you see the WFSI, WFSI is just the wave factor score indexes, right? That uh, that that here, and that's what the uh, NKG, uh, the NKG group use the uh, the WFSI. That's the U.S. based index that we use. So, so that's the process. By which we uh, we create the Johannesburg uh, indices, uh, ESG in indices. So now next, we um, the here this is where we do the uh, the, the the analysis for the uh, uh, exploratory uh, factor anal um, test, right? To to do the to see whether EFA is uh, supported, we look at the the new hypothesis. Right? The new hypothesis here is that there are no no common factors, right? There are no common factors. That's the the new hypothesis. So we look at the Barclay test. The Barclay test here is um, uh, the Barclay test. We just spoke about that. It's just uh, a statistical test used to for in factor analysis to access whether the correlation matrix of a data. Uh, is significantly different from the identi uh, identity uh, matrix. It's, it's just another way to evaluate whether the data set is appropriate for factor analysis, just like the uh, KMO test, right? So the conclusion here is that um, uh, the KMO test is likely below 79%, which means that the factor analysis for a study is quite robust, 
why? It's quite robust. Uh, next, we talk about factor factor loadings for. Let's talk about factor loading for the uh, for the e domain. Uh, factor loading for uh, for for the e domain. So here, uh, what we can see here is that. Uh, uh, for the lambda, right, lambda uh, greater or equal to one, right, so again, this is used in, uh, uh, for dimensionality uh, reduction. Uh, we don't keep any factors uh, with eigenvalue less than one. So lambda is the, the, uh, the eigenvalue, right? Uh, so here we, we can see uh, the, the result for factor four, right, factor four. Factor four here, a, a lab label for a South African uh, gold mining company. And uh, factor five is for the South African uh, 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 multinational precious metal mining company. You would expect the E here to behave in a, you know, like the, the EHT uh, score, for like for the E to be really, really bad, right? So what we see here in terms of South Africa, the factor loading of 0.1349 uh, and 0.1740 for the E dimension su suggests that there is a correspondence of the E dimension between uh, South Africa and, and the US, right? Um, uh, which is quite not surprising if you look at the E pillar, environmental pillar. These are mining company. Uh, what, what do you expect, right? In terms of South Africa and US, these are very almost developed country when they, in America you have oil. It's a lot of oil company. In, in South Africa you have mining company. This is a lot of gold there, right? So we have some sort of uh, uh, corresponding uh, for the, when it comes to dimensionality between, uh, for the E period only. Uh, but we can see that for, for the E uh, dimension or for the E domain between the US, um, that E domain can be, is also different for the two uh, overlap at a small level for, for factor four and uh, factor five. So uh, now the EH index derivation from factor score, we talked a little bit about this uh, earlier. Uh, we, we talked a bit about that. So we, we talked, we, we spoke about uh, the C, right, the, the number of factor. The, the GSC factor score indices, the, the, the WJSE uh, uh, under the E, S, and, and G domain at time T, I calculated, I just, as we just said, the simple average uh, across the C factor score, right? Using the very max uh, rotate factors. Uh, so you took it, uh, you look at the, for the each uh, security, you take the sum of them at the observation, uh, I made a little typo here. I think I should put K, right? It's K for the security. Um, uh, I put originally AI, but when I was doing, going back to the creation, or like that, I used K. So it's actually K uh, security. And uh, for the SD, we retain um, uh, K equal to one to five. For the government pilot, we retain K equal to uh, to one to 11. So we sum all of that over the observation, uh, I'm looking at the observation too, over the, the C. The C is the uh, number of factors, right? And, and for uh, the E pillar, we have 11 factors. For this, so the S pillar, we have five, and G pillar, we had 11 factors. And as we just said, N uh, is equal to 204 over T, T, is the number of days uh, that we actually, uh, during which we conduct our study, right? And it's the number of uh, security. So uh, now, something uh, interesting that happened here when we check for correlation, right? You can understand why uh, earlier we had uh, uh, a picture of the MSCI, right? So when we do the comparison between uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, GSC ESG indices with the published MSCI South Africa ESG indices. We, uh, white, uh, MSCI is a, is a leading uh, ESG uh, uh, index. It's a leader in ESG uh, index uh, in, in South Africa as well. So one of the things you find here is that uh, 
the red one has a negative uh, correlation. And, and uh, if you look at the E and the S weight, you have uh, a correlation about uh, 0.519, right, at uh, uh, quite significant at uh, P less than um, uh, 0.0, uh, 0.5, right? So, so uh, issues that uh, our results, the correlation uh, of our results are, are pretty uh, realistic and, and uh, um, are pretty good as well in terms of results and in terms of correlation. Uh, okay, now this is just a snapshot of uh, the uh, GSE uh, EHG indices, right? Uh, as we, um, uh, well, in our studies, uh, this is just a snapshot of it. So next we're gonna look at something uh, else. We're gonna look at the, the, um, uh, something very interesting, right? This is the, um, uh, the efficient set with the uh, GSC, uh, with the, G, uh, the global minimum variance portfolio, which is uh, equally very, uh, it's, it's very interesting. Here on the, the, on the graph on the far right, you see uh, the zoom in effect of the three different frontier we see on the left. Because here on the left, you can really see uh, what's uh, what's happening? So, uh, on the right, this has been zoomed so that you can see clearly what what's happening. And what's happening is very very interesting. So the green legion that you see there uh, is uh, represent the traditional uh, classic, or right, the classic Markowitz uh, efficient frontier with an um, uh, OAS uh, string, right? So it's, uh, OAS is just um, I think it's uh, Oracle. Approximate, approximating uh, shrinkage, right? So uh, that green legend represents a traditional um, uh, Markowitz uh, efficient frontier, like Harry uh, Markowitz, that uh, if you guys remember, he died earlier uh, this year. And it's actually, uh, if you guys uh, want to attend, uh, the SQA is having a half day conference in, uh, in honor to, uh, to uh, Harry Markowitz, uh, I think some, sometime, seen, um, sometime this month. Uh, you guys should consider attending that. It's gonna be uh, very interesting. And one of the guys um, that I know who was uh, a student of Harry Markowitz, James Otto, that Dr. Adams know as well, is gonna be speaking at that uh, SQA conference. So the, the green legend represents the traditional class, uh, the traditional Markowitz uh, efficient frontier with uh, a, uh, an OAS uh, strong covariance matrix, right? An OAS uh, strong covariance matrix. So the blue legion that you see uh, represent uh, the sharp CU1 efficient frontier, which is a sharp multi-index model, right? And this here, this um, use or not just beta, but assume the indices are correlated. And then the red legion, uh, the red legion represents the sharp CU efficient frontier, which is a sharp single uh, index uh, uh, model. So what we see here is, first of all, that the global minimum variance portfolio um, uh, compute by the, the, the green, like the marker with the sharp CU and the sharp CU is statistically undisturbed by the inclusion of our South Africa uh, 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 EHT factors. And then the dominion frontier, evidently, in this case, is the classic Markowitz model, right, generated by strong covariance matrix. The next two frontier are the sharp CU and the sharp CU, the sharp CU1 and the sharp CU, uh, which use the diagonal model or sharp to approximate the Markowitz frontier. So what uh, happened is that the single index sharp model, right, the single index sharp model, sharp CU, and its multiple index counterpart, sharp CU1, show no material difference in the production of the, the global minimum uh, uh, your global minimum variance portfolio. Uh, this is a very good result in our analysis because uh, the new indices that we just derived, because of this result, can be used in subsequent study 
uh, like uh, study of elasticity, elasticity of the factor for individual firm. That's something that uh, can be done because of this result. That our indices can actually be used to study maybe elasticity uh, of the factors for uh, individual firm. So um, next, so here we're going to look at uh, something interesting. Uh, you know, in uh, the day and age, we can look at the the issue of uh, you know, artificial intelligence. How does our model, how does our result fare when it comes to uh, um, uh, uh, artificial prediction? Right. So here we have um, a multiple target radio basis function uh, neural uh, network, right? So say they call it K7 because they say univariate target called K4. So here we're talking mainly about the, the K7, which is a multivariate uh, uh, radio basis artificial uh, neural network. So um, this is just an explanation, right? This is uh, a uh, classic explanation of how that works. You have the input layer, you have the hidden layer, and then you have the output, uh, the output layers, right? The hidden layer use the radio basis function, right, to transform the input data into the output, which is, uh, in this case, it's a, it's a suitable uh, representation for regression, right? So that's what was happening here. So it's becoming gradually more and more popular. It's becoming, uh, it's getting very, very popular, although it's existed, it has existed for, for, for so many years, and it actually, um, my uh, co-author uh, uh, have been doing this work on uh, a radio basis uh, neural network for over 25 years, I mean, maybe 30 years, right? And now it's becoming uh, quite mainstream. So, um, so what's happening uh, uh, with when we we, uh, we look at our results here? But let's look, talk a bit about uh, the. Uh, the neural network a little bit. So here, you just see how the, the regulator, regulation, uh, regulation, regularization risk of cost function is uh, usually uh, compute uh, this way, where uh, uh, y is, uh, is the output, right? y is the, the output, and then you have uh, wu is the wave vector, and uh, you have uh, lambda, Lambda is the regularization parameter that control the compromise between the degree of smoothness of the solution and its closeness to, uh, to the data, right? So we can successfully uh, prove that for the multi uh, 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 variate radio uh, basis function for uh, artificial neural network, the estimate weight are analogous to nonlinearly square regression parameter. Um, or this here where W is the way and then you have H which is uh, uh, the hidden layer and uh, you have gamma, the, lead, the loading factors and then you have the I uh, as the identity matrix, right? And then you take the transport of that. It, it can be successfully shown. You can take a class called matrix analysis but I think it's mostly for those who I uh, do a master in applied mathematics. If you learn a master in applied mathematics, that's a required class. It's called matrix analysis. You probably can be true. It's a pretty, maybe three or four step proof uh, here. So let's uh, uh, now, uh, yeah? Okay, good. So this is an example of multivariate uh, radio function artificial network, uh, neural network, right? So, if we, we go to, like, we're now in the Afri South African uh, uh, market, right? So um, you have uh, this uh, company here. Uh, Thai, uh, T-H-A, is a company, it's called Teresa PLC. It's an investment holding company engaged in mining, processing, uh, beneficiation, and marketing uh, in, uh, uh, mostly present in the BRICS country. Like, like Brazil, uh, South Africa, India, uh, China, and uh, else, right? And then GBL is the it's another company. It's a metal company. It's called Jubilee Metal. Right? Explore. They uh, they usually are in the business of exploring, acquiring, and developing property for platinum extraction. Like right? some of the the platinums 
what they use. And then uh, we look also at uh, the GML. Uh, GML is another company, it's Gimfield Group, it's an LTD. It's engaged in the mining and marketing of color gemstones. So when we do the predictive analysis um, uh, using this, we, we look at the, the, uh, the, the next uh, time and we look at all these different variable, the uh, one new indices, right? for South Africa under the ESNG domain. And we uh, also included this other variable, uh, which here are uh, uh, CG2, PL2 is a change in the ratio of gold to platinum, right? Talk about gold, you cannot talk about South Africa without mentioning gold, right? So, and then um, uh, RSA VIX is the return of the South Africa VIX index, and RSA 40 is the return of the South Africa 40 mining index. And uh, RSA 40 future is the return of the South Africa 40 future index. So we do the analysis, and some of the, these are some of the, uh, the results of, uh, of a prediction for, those, uh, for this company. Um, the red ones are the negative ones. Uh, uh, now, if when we plug that into, uh, when we uh, plug all those results and look at the neural com behavior of this result, this is what you see, right? Uh, uh, that's what you see. The, the red line indicate negative weight, right? This line here, they, they show negative weight for, for, for each of these companies. Uh, and you see these are the output, and these are the, 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 the negative weight to the hidden you said the hidden layers, the hidden nodes, you can, you can see them. So that's uh, basically what, uh, what you get there when uh, you do uh, the analysis. Uh, now, when you come to predicted returns, like, uh, when you come to predicted returns, um, you have the, some of the results here. Uh, we just did it for one model. Uh, the A, model one, is the actual, and the P is the predicted. You see our prediction in average are not very bad. We can extend it for this presentation. We just use model one. You can extend this to several, several other models. So in conclusion, uh, what we've done, uh, as we uh, discussed earlier, we construct three capital weight uh, ESG portfolio using a selection of uh, uh, Johannesburg Stock Exchange Company, recognized for the corporate social responsibility practices and most of them are present within the BRICS country, which is uh, Brazil, Russia, India, and uh, China, and South Africa, right? And then going to a step further, we extend the funding of uh, uh, this paper. I think um, uh, one of these guys actually presented recently at the SQA would say, uh, he would say uh, uh, a, uh, a, an event, online event, it was a virtual event. So Gu, Kelly, and Zhu, on asset pricing via machine learning to map sustainability coefficient, creating unique ESNG factor tailor to the GSC. And they, in the paper, they basically show that uh, neural network, uh, RAM, multivariate uh, neural network, uh, machine learning are very good at predicting uh, return. And I will certainly extend, uh, extend the investment uh, factor literature in two important ways. First, by employing a machine learning approach to access ESG factor efficiency using uh, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange for, uh, firm. And two, by demonstrating a significant enhancement in the link in the risk return profile of the GSC global data, uh, global minimum variance portfolio um, that we just spoke about compared to traditional method like the, the one we we, uh, we discussed the sharp CU1, the sharp CU1, um, the Markowitz, we spoke about the Markowitz one as well, efficient frontier. So the implication of our work extends to the broader investment landscape, providing a data-driven framework to access sustainability factors. We just spoke about in the emerging market, we spoke about the elasticity, how some of the indices that we just derived can be used later to study uh, the implication or elasticity between uh, uh, individual firms. And, and as you guys know, BRICS is in the process of extending. So at the recent BRICS conference, they talk about extending themselves to maybe 20 more countries. So this, uh, 
this analysis can be extended maybe when we get enough data, when those countries join, um, this analysis can be extended to those countries uh, when they will be allowed to trade in the Johannesburg stock exchanges. So these are some of the implications of our paper. And uh, we don't know when those companies will be uh, accepted within uh, uh, BRICS, those country be accepted within BRICS. And they might be, because I think the S&P 500 ESG indexes, they might be able to compete with the, the S&P 500 or US ESG indexes if when those companies come into play. Then uh, factor analysis became even more relevant and more mainstream. So that will be uh, the end of uh, our discussion. Looking forward to you guys' uh, question. And thank you for coming. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, Dr. Adams. Yeah, that's a very pertinent question because uh, if you look at the time frame, including the 2020, uh, we know that during 2020, COVID was uh, quite intense, 2021. So that's a pretty uh, interesting question. Uh, I'll be happy to look at it at, uh, in terms of what they're doing now and compared to the, what was happening then. So that may have been a factor. That, that might be, because uh, evidently during uh, 2020, um, emissions were low. P people were driving less. Also, everybody was working virtually at home. So uh, there was definitely less emission. And we've made some conclusion about the e, uh, the e domain uh, for this um, uh, uh, for this uh, for this company and for these countries. Yeah, so it's a very uh, interesting question. Uh, I think it'd be interesting to look at uh, uh, maybe uh, four or five years from now because we have 20 from 2020 to 2023. So let's look, let's see what happened from 2023 to maybe uh, 2026. Yeah. Yeah, thank you uh, for that question. Yes? Yeah, yeah, the, the equally um, good question. Uh, for the first one, um, uh, when it comes to, uh, uh, I, I think consistent res research have shown that uh, uh, ESG uh, investment, uh, ESG link indexes are resilient. So they are, when it comes to downturn, when the economy goes down, they're usually resilient. They don't just fall apart. Uh, I remember uh, one, uh, maybe two or three years ago, I have a student who did some research on that, and they found out that uh, ESG uh, investment um, were usually resilient, right? Um, so when it comes to returns, um, they're not very, um, the, the return are usually not as expected, particularly for maybe, um, here maybe in, here in America, but, and I think that's explained the, the, uh, the um, the reason why this always say uh, push against uh, ESG, but in other country, if you do an analysis of maybe the South African market, you see that uh, ESG indices perform pretty well, even in the European uh, market and uh, Canadian market. Uh, even here, 
because you know, they, they, there's a lot of push here in America, particularly, which may affect the performance of those uh, uh, e EHT uh, indices. Uh, and um, your second question um, about chemistry, we're talking about the uh, extension of factor. So when you say EHT, what application are you referring to? Is, are you uh, saying that? Uh, yeah. Chemistry, yeah, chemistry and uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think, I don't think they, they can be, they should be limited to chemistry uh, industry. It's true that there's a lot of things going on. Maybe for the E, you can see the link between chemistry and the E domain, right? The environment. There's a lot of talk about carbon sequestration, which is very uh, chemistry uh, based. Um, uh, yeah, we, you know, I think uh, it's really, really comes to data availability uh, data gathering. We will not be able to do a factor analysis or uh, derive uh, EHG indices if there were not data right, that very rigorously uh, collected and measured. So it's really much about data. It's probably, I think when somebody was saying that for the E domain, it's very easy to get data. The way people struggle is like the S domain, the G domain, right? But remember that even company, if they just invest a bit into data gathering, being serious about the EHG uh, consideration, the EHG commitment, uh, if you look like they're talking about FTX, right, um, uh, Sam Batten, uh, Fry, uh, but if you look at two, three years ago, if the G pillar would be major, he didn't have, he, there was no accountability in this company, FTX, there was no, um, there was no transparency, Right? If you look, there was nothing. So if that was being measured, people could have seen that, hey, this company is at risk because of the G domain. They're not doing, they're not, they're not transparent, there's no accountability, and, and that's exactly what happened to that company, and that's how it fell. So you say, really need to measure what's happening, uh, and then use those numbers, those data, to um, be calibrate to, um, to constrain your investment to those ESG data, ESG consideration, and see how good you're doing. Uh, and that's what many, uh, many companies in Europe and, and elsewhere have been doing. Um, here, some companies are doing it, some are becoming conscious. Um, that's really where, you, and then, then the analysis will be able to be extended to other companies, not only uh, 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 chemistry-based companies. How far? Yes. Uh, the, you mean the, the GSC indices? Uh, indices? Yes. Uh, you said ESG outperformed the GSC? Yes. Because we, what we did was the analysis of the indices on the joint networks, the ESG indices on the joint network um, uh, stock exchange. So that, that was where our analysis was, was based. And we found that there was some correspondence between the E period for some South African-based company and U.S.-based company using the, the NKG uh, indices, which is the WFI, uh, 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 the FSI, FSI, yeah. Yes. Yeah, you may go to that slide, yeah? Yeah, sure. Right here. Yeah. 
So, so the graph is just um, saying that uh, when we compute uh, the, uh, the global uh, uh, minimum variance portfolio for our results by using uh, this different uh, model, the marker will, will come first and then followed by the sharp CU and the sharp uh, CU, right? And when we do uh, the single index sharp ratio model, right? When we do the, the test uh, between, they, they're all efficient frontier. All these three are efficient frontier, right? And when we do uh, the single, when we look at the, the single index sharp model and the multiple index counter, the counterplot, we see that there is no material difference in the production of the uh, the global minimum uh, uh, variance portfolio, right? There's no meaning that well, indices can be used uh, for for, the, for uh, are very good, and it can be they can be used for to further some other studies. That's basically what it means there. Uh, so this just show that um, uh, the efficient frontier, the Markowitz, and some other ones. Uh, be, behave well when we in, in our model. That our model is not something atypical, something that uh, is a model that behaves very well under this. Uh, this, this Uh, okay, so here we're not really looking at the volatility. I think I understand where, where you're going. Uh, volatility evidently is a very important component of the capital asset trust model. Yeah, but we, we're not really looking at the volatility here. It's, it's just how our indices behave under these three frontiers. Yes, uh, yes. Okay, this is another lecture. Okay, thank you. Thank you for guys for your question. And uh, yeah, thank you. Good. Okay. I think you are clear. Okay.